And uh, as we are here this morning, uh, if you don't mind, if you, how about guys, just for today, if we could maybe gather toward the front. We have a monsoon going on outside. And if you don't mind, fill in toward the front. And uh, thank you so much, but young man. I appreciate it. We have a monsoon going on out there. I know a lot of people sent me texts saying that they could not even get out of their neighborhood. Uh, that it was raining uh, that uh, that hard. Amen. But I thank the Lord for these brave souls that I see sitting here this morning that uh, have come out through the rain, come into the parking lot that's a wash. How many people here have got nice wet feet and ankles? Amen. There we go. Uh, so, well, at least we had Pastor Divine out there and my Brother Aaron out there to uh, keep the rain off your heads as much as possible and get you inside. Amen. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just such a great day to be here. Grace and peace from God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, today, as we uh, continue our current series of being radically on mission, we come to today's message called Certain About Christ. Are you certain about Jesus Christ in your life? Amen. Hallelujah. And so all over the sanctuary, whether in printed or digital format, if you have the Word of God, please hold your Bibles up in the air. All over the sanctuary. Amen. Amen. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have it in digital format, go get a Bible. I see our men are out there helping get folks inside here. Turn to Acts chapter 10, verses 38 through 48. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 through 48. And uh, I know that uh, some of you have been wondering about the different announcements that we've been making. Uh, but we will have a, a special time at the end of today's service during the announcements to go over the things that we discussed last week and voted on. If you are there in the Word of God, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, please say, Amen. Amen. Reading from the Word of God. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to back up to verse 34. And so, Marianne, you just wait till we get to the slide, and then you can work your way forward. If you're at 34, say amen. amen. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive, God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now picking it up with today's text. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained to, by God to be judge of the living and dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. May the Lord add his blessing upon his word. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for your word, your Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the mercy tree of Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, as we come here this morning, I look around the sanctuary, I see friends. Uh, oh, Trudy, it's so good you could get out of your neighborhood this morning. Uh, I understand that last week you were, you were locked in, uh, Miss Ruth Ann. Miss Ruth Ann apparently gets all the updates. And if you notice, uh, Miss Ruth Ann is not here this morning. 
Uh, she is in Orlando with our daughter. She went up to visit for a, a couple of days. She was supposed to drive back down last night and uh, looking at the weather I told her just to, to go ahead and stay and that I could use a couple more days of unsupervised uh, living. <laughs> now listen guys, Cornelius was a centurion. He was a Roman army officer, but he has a hunger to know God. A hunger to know the things of God. Flip over to verse 1 right there in chapter 10. Look at verses 1 through 3 there. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, of what was called the Italian regiment. This was the toughest, the roughest, the most innermost uh, fighting group of men for the Romans. A devout man, and one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. You see, God has gotten this unbelieving Roman. What do I mean by unbelieving? It says that he was a, a devout man. Well, uh, friends, you can be devout and be devout about the wrong things. Amen? You can be uh, on fire for something and find out it's absolutely the incorrect thing. So God has gotten this unbelieving Roman and the Apostle Peter together. Look, if you will, at verses 30 and 31. So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. God has said, if you seek me, you will find me. Amen. And if you seek me with all your heart, you will definitely find me. And so Cornelius has been seeking God. And he sits down in front of Peter. And in verses 24 to 37, and I'm not going to read those, but essentially he says this, I'm paraphrasing. All right, here we are. Tell me all about it. We want to know how to be saved. We want to be certain of where we spend eternity. You know, I see that all the time in church, guys. Amen? Uh, we get visitors that have never been in church or been in church very little. And, and uh, you know, they're, they're bored with church because they've already done that. Amen? And the problem is, is they know about church, but they don't know about Jesus Christ as Lord. And here at Living Hope Baptist Church, what we preach, I may have faults, but one of them is not in the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? There are many, many pastors who can preach the gospel better than I can, but nobody can preach a better gospel. Because the gospel is the gospel. Good news is good news. Uh, let me say, share this with you. If, you found, if, if someone were to uh, discover that you had inherited $10 million, do you really care who brought you the news? It's still good news, amen? amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I'm looking forward to your tithe. <laughs> so we want to be certain of where we spend eternity. And you know what, guys? You know, I just, first time I've ever slid one of those in there. <laughs> you know what, guys? Cornelius is seeking after God with all of his heart. And let me tell you something. We're supposed to be fishers of men, amen? amen? But it's not really fishing when they just jump in the boat. And that's what Cornelius is doing here. P Peter is a fisher of men. He's sharing the gospel. But this fisher just, just found, sought him out, found him, and jumped in the boat himself. And so today, I have three points to help you today on how to know how to be certain about who Jesus Christ is. You know, I, I spent my first 15 years in ministry thinking that I would be d working in apologetics, a defender of the faith, and I learned all the original languages, and I learned the nuances of uh, different denominations and all of that uh, when the Lord called me to be a pastor. There's a vast difference between a preacher and a pastor. Amen? You know, a preacher can just go in and stir up the water and cause all kind of trouble and move on. You know, but the pastor tends the flock. You know, he's the shepherd. And I, I can't imagine a better flock than the one I have. I simply cannot imagine it. Uh, it's, uh, you guys are such a blessing to me. Miss Ruth Ann sends her love. Point number one. Point number one in, in, in being certain of Christ is that the saints bear witness. The saints bear witness, witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. If you're an American citizen... Uh, how many of you ever been called for that wonderful, joyous opportunity called jury duty? It's our civic duty, amen? And it's not always that enjoyable, 
uh, by the matter of fact, you know, uh, sometimes I think uh, sitting on a jury of this person's peers, I wonder how in the world did I find my way there. But uh, when a jury is put together, uh, the desire is that you wanted to be able to come to a conclusion, but you also wanted to represent a broad spectrum of that individual's community. Hallelujah. You wanted to represent a broad spectrum of the accused community. What is a jury's job? A jury's job is to listen to the facts and make a decision. And that's what Jesus Christ did when he took the disciples with him in his ministry years here on earth. They lived with him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They ate meals and they fellowshiped with him. In other words, they were a walking, talking, select jury of Christ's peers from the community from which he came. Well, what kind of a jury were they, these guys? You want, you want to know about a motley crew, guys. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm reminded uh, of a story. It's, it's simply a story but where, where Jesus uh, got back into heaven after his ascension. And he, he's met in the throne room of heaven uh, by Gabriel and Michael and Caleb and the other archangels. And they say, uh, 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 Lord, how did it go? How did the plan work out? And Jesus said, it went perfectly. And he goes, what is the plan? Well, those guys right there are going to share the gospel throughout the ends of the world. And the angels looked and went, those guys? Do you have a plan B? There is no plan B. You see, let me share something about these guys. First, there was John. John was young, probably a teenager. He's a visionary. He's a, he's a philosopher. If you, when you read the book of John, you come to that conclusion that he, he is all about the deity of Christ. There was Simon Peter. Rough, coarse, big mouth. I love Simon Peter. Sounds like me sometimes. He was a hard-working fisherman, guys. And by the way, if you ever go down to the intercoastal and, 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 and talk to some of the fishermen down there, they're not exactly the best of society at all times. The guys that work on the fishing boats. Then there was Simon the Zealot. What does it mean to be a zealot? Zealot was a far right-winger. He was right of Attila the Hung when it came to Israel. He was 100% for a free Israel. He hated the Romans. And so obviously, the next disciple I want to mention is Matthew, who was a Jew, but he was a publican. Do you know what a publican is? That was a tax collector. He collected, tax, he collected, he collected taxes from his own people for the Romans. How do you suppose that initially went over with Simon the Zealot? You think there weren't some awkward, awkward times around the dinner table? Amen. Now let me ask you guys something. I know this could never happen in this, thing, in, in, in this fellowship. But has there ever been a time when you've had a falling out with a member of your family? Even after you've grown up. Isn't it awkward at Thanksgiving? Yeah, you guys are sitting there with blank looks like you've never done that. <laughs> Sounds like Pastor Larry's getting a little personal here. I'm meddling, so I'll move along. So, in other words, uh, Matthew was a, was a publican, a, a, a Jew that had sold out to the Roman government. Then there was Nathaniel the cynic. What did Nathaniel say the first time we find him in Scripture? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Moving on, we have Doubting Thomas. We all know Doubting Thomas. Next was Philip. He was a numbers guy. When Jesus said, how will I feed these people... Philip knew the numbers. He knew what it would cost. You know, we, 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 we've got that here in our, in our church. You know, I, I ask Brother Jim all the time. Brother Jim uh, does our finances. I said, don't walk around looking worried. It upsets the flock when the finance guy is walking around looking worried. And so, next comes James. James was no nonsense. No nonsense about him whatsoever. If you don't think so, go read the book of James. And see what's in there. Andrew. Nice guy. Just a nice guy. Every time we see Andrew in, in Scripture, he's introducing someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Every single time. And so on and so on. Friends, you could not have gotten a more diverse group of people that would be witnesses about Jesus Christ. They were a diverse group. And together, they concluded that Jesus Christ is God. That's what they concluded. They were absolutely convicted of that fact. In fact, you could not get them to change their stories even if you killed them. And so I asked today, are you willing to go to that length? What if, they, what if they were to burst in here right now and say, deny Christ or die? Where do you stand on that? Are you completely convicted? Are you completely connected? Are you completely certain of the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. You see, friends, you cannot unsee what you have seen. I'm going to say that one more time. It looks like you guys didn't get it there. The rain might have drowned your, 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 your attitudes a little bit. You cannot unsee that which you have seen. Amen. You cannot unchrist yourself once you have seen Christ, no matter what you try to do. Amen. And so Peter is saying, don't tell me he didn't turn the water into wine. I drank some of it, and it was really good. Amen. He said, don't tell me that he didn't walk on the water. I was out there walking with him, briefly. And while we're on it, people all the time say, yeah, well, you know, Peter walked on the water, but he, had a, he, 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 st he, he struggled in his faith, and so he started slipping into the water. Yeah, well, you guess what? There are 11 other pair of eyes in the boat watching. He got out of the boat. Amen. You know, my goal is to step out so far for Jesus Christ in faith, but the Lord has no choice but to save me when I falter. Because he is faithful, amen? And he will never falter. Don't tell me I didn't, he didn't walk in the water. I was there. Don't tell me he didn't raise that little girl from the dead. I saw her. I spoke with her. Don't tell me I didn't see his majesty. I was an eye eyewitness when he was transfigured. Not only that, I heard God speak from heaven and say, This is my beloved son. I, wi I witnessed how amazing of a life he led. I was witness to his personal witness of never having sinned. Then Peter says in verse 39, look at verse 39. If you're there, say amen. amen. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. He's saying we were witnesses not only of his life, we were witnesses of his death. His life and his death as well. We were there. Standing afar off. Have you ever noticed it was the ladies that, that stayed faithful there? That stayed close? Except for John who was there, the beloved disciple. All the disciples ran away. God bless the ladies in our church. And of all our ladies say, Amen. Hallelujah. So they said, listen, we were standing there back in the crowd. And we saw this. We watched as the soldiers drove those nails into his hands. We heard him cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We were there when Jesus said, I thirst upon the cross. We were there when he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. We were there when he said in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. We were there when he died, and they thrust a spear into his side. We were there when they took him down and laid him in a grave. We were personal eyewitnesses of his death. We were right there through the whole thing. Friends, they were eyewitnesses to his life. They were eyewitnesses to his death. To his death. But glory be to God, they were also eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Look at verse 40 again, please. Him, God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Isn't that great? I love that. Just that simple sentence. Friends, if, if, if you don't know a whole lot of theology, write that verse down right there. Acts chapter 10, verse 40. Write it in the front of your Bible. Write it on your hand. Bury it in your heart. How do we know? Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Peter's saying, this is a fact. 
God raised him from the dead and I saw him walking around. I saw him dead and in the grave. I saw him live and walking around. Well, how do I know it wasn't just a hallucination? Well, because you can't get these 11 other guys to hallucinate the same thing. And even if you could, Scripture says that there were 500 others that saw Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave. 500! Can you imagine such a thing? So church, let me ask you this. Can you imagine a courtroom and you're on the witness stand, amen, and you're innocent, and one person comes in and tells the jury, I saw him, he didn't do that. Well, that's okay, right? But 500? After 10 or 15, the judge will go, that's enough. Let this man go. Let this man go. In other words, 500 witnesses said, we all saw the same exact thing, and here's what we saw. We saw Jesus. And that's why people come to church. For your witness, have you seen Jesus show up in your heart? That's the question I have today for you. Because that is a powerful, powerful eyewitness. Listen guys, say what you want. They can say what they want about all of the witnesses and all that, but something changed those men. They went from the guys that all ran away to the men that went willingly and willingly and willingly to their death, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, when you have a group of witnesses that is willing to die for what they have seen, to bear witness to that, rather than change their story, there is nothing more powerful than that. Nothing. They said, we saw his life. We saw his death. And we saw God raise him up from the grave again. Hallelujah to the glory of God. We were witnesses to it all. So not only did the saints bear witness. Now watch this. The scriptures bear witness as well. That's our second point for today. The scriptures bear witness as well. Looking at verse 42 and verse 43. If you're there, please say amen. amen. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. You know, there are some primary verses in, in the Bible. You know, all the Bible is the Word of God, amen? It's all about Jesus, and all the Bible is important. But there are some verses that are just dipped in the glory of God. And these two verses are it. These are a couple of verses you should have underlined in your Bible. And here's why. They are the absolute key to understanding Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. They are key to that. Do you, want me to, you want me to tell you what the Old Testament is about? Look up here, church. Everybody look up here. You want to know what the Old Testament was about? All about Jesus. All about Jesus. You want to know what the Old Testament is, saving, is saying? Jesus saves. All through the Old Testament. Look at verse 43 again. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Remission. Forgiveness. Freed from your bondage. It has one message, and that message is that only and on, Jesus only saves. No one else except Jesus. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except to, through me. Scripture is not written primarily to give us a history of Israel. It's not written primarily to give us a, an outline of the ceremonies that are to be in there for church. It is written to deliver God's plan. And God's plan is that Jesus Christ saves. And there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you may be saved, but by the name of Jesus. Look at how verse 43 starts again. To him, that's Jesus they're talking about, to him, all of the prophets witness that through his name. Listen, folks. When you open your Bibles and you start reading from the front to the back, you should find Jesus all the way through. As soon as your cover is lifted off your Bible, Jesus steps out of the pages into your presence. It's all about Jesus. When God said in the Old Testament, build me a tabernacle, that was all about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
How do I know this? Well, we did a series on that. Amen? The wilderness tabernacle as well as the tabernacle, Solomon's tabernacle. The things made out of acacia wood in that tabernacle speak about the humanity of Christ. When the wood was overlaid with gold, that speaks of the deity of Christ. When you came into the tabernacle yard, the first thing that you saw was the brazen uh, laver, which... Pardon me, the brazen altar of sacrifice, which speaks of Christ, our sacrifice. Moving on, you came to the labor, which, which spoke about Christ, our sanctification. You go on and you go inside the, 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 the tent, the, the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place. You go inside there and, and you see that there's a table with bread on it called the showbread, meaning Christ is our sustenance. Does Christ sustain you? Is Christ enough for your heart? Is he the sustenance of your heart? Across from the showbread in the same room, here's a candlestick that speaks of Christ, our light. Right in front of the veil, there was an altar of incense, which means Christ, our supplication, our interce intercessor of prayer before the Father. The veil spoke of the body of Christ and the person of Christ. What color was the veil? The veil was purple, blue, red, with threads of white. Now some of you... Know where I'm going with this, amen? You've heard this many times before. But the, 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 the color, color purple speaks about King Jesus. And when you think of King Jesus, when you look in the Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew is all about King Jesus. And therefore, that's the color purple. The book of Mark is all about the suffering servant, that Christ suffered and died for us. What's the color of suffering, friends? And death, red, the blood of Jesus Christ, and so you have you have the pur you have the purple, you have you have the the, the red. Uh, Luke is all about King Jesus of the of the royal family, and the royal family wears what? It wears royal blue. How do you get purple? You mix blue and red in equal measure. You see, you cannot get the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ without equal parts of the suffering of Christ. And the, and the humanity of Christ. And what is, weaves it all together? Well, the book of John is all about the deity of Christ, the holiness of Jesus Christ, the Lord God Jesus Christ. And that speaks of his deity, which is pure, it's holy, the color white. So his majesty, with equal, made of equal parts of, 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 uh, of humanity and suffering, woven together with the threads of holiness. The veil is about the Lord Jesus Christ. The veil in the, in the temple is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then you come into the inner room. The holy of holies and the mercy seat. That is about Christ, the satisfaction. He is our satisfaction. You know, when they, when they finished the tabernacle, it says, The Shekinah glory of the Lord descended into the holy of holies. And rested on the mercy seat. There's a, re there's a reason it rested on the mercy seat, friends, in the Holy of Holies. It's because the mercy seat covered the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were, were, was the book of the laws, and, and the, the, the jar of manna, and, and, and the, a piece of the staff of Aaron. But the important part is that it, it, it was the, the book of the law was in there. And the only thing that saves us, the book of the law representing the judgment of God, the only thing that saves us from the, from the judgment of Almighty God is that His Shekinah glory rests on His mercy. Amen. And His mercy makes a way for us to be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, it's all about Jesus. The verse says, To Him all the prophets give witness. Uh, what a testimony to the unity of the Bible. What a confirmation of our faith in the Bible. No single man could write this book. It had about 40 or 42 different authors over a 1,600-year uh, period, and they are all in harmony. They all come to the same conclusion, Jesus saves. That's what the harmony is about. And all of the, all of the, the prophets have one message. Jesus saves. When God made a covering in the, in the Garden of Eden to cover up Adam and Eve's nakedness, let me tell you something. He made it out of the skin of an animal. That, skin just, that, that animal just didn't take off his skin. That animal had to die. It had to be sacrificed. That talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. When Abel killed the sacrificial lamb, it was saying that Jesus saved. When Isaac was offered up as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah, the message was Jesus saves. The Passover lamb's message was that what? 
Jesus saves. The message of Moses' Moses's serpent, brass serpent, lifted up in the wilderness was what? That Jesus Christ saves. There has never been one plan of salvation throughout history, throughout all of Scripture, and that there's never been anything else, is that, that the plan of salvation is that we are saved. It's in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought you'd be more excited about that. I'm, I'm glad I am. People in the Old Testament were, were, were people in the Old Testament were saved how? By looking forward to the promises of God, by looking forward to the Messiah, by looking forward to salvation through Jesus Christ. People in Christ's time were saved by looking at Christ Himself and believing. And we are saved by both looking backward to what Christ has done while looking forward to His return while Christ lives in us. Give God praise in His house. You see, people of all ages are saved by looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, i got a news flash for you. Christ is right here in this room. Amen. He's here today. Because if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Scripture says that Christ lives in you. Amen. And you don't get all, all just a part of Him. You get all of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are inheritors of heaven. Friends, people of all ages were saved by looking to the Lord Jesus and he's coming through. Amen. He's coming very soon. The Lord Jesus that lived then, the Lord Jesus that lived now, is also the Lord Jesus that's coming again. Give him praise in his house. Amen. So we see the saints that bear witness. We see the scriptures that bear witness. And finally now we see that the Holy Spirit of God bears witness to the Lord Jesus. Now what happened is this in our story today, in, in Acts chapter 10. Peter gives the first witness. The scripture says that uh, but when we read that the scripture gives a second witness, and now the Holy Spirit gives the third witness. Let's look at verses 44, 44 to 48 one more time. If you dare say amen. amen. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles only. You know, that, that sounds just like Christians in a church. Well, I'm saved. I don't know about all them. I know Jesus came for me. I'm not, quite so, I'm not quite sure he came for that person. Amen? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that they should not be baptized who has received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now listen to me closely. Cornelius' heart is so hungry that Peter doesn't have to talk to him or convince him of anything. He's simply there to listen. He believes in Jesus Christ and he relieves, receives the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I just want to share one thing with you very quickly. The term tongues that is used here is not the confused language. It is not that. This is the other word. I'm not going to go all Greek on you guys this morning. Uh, even though I know you love that. Maybe you do. What this is talks about other languages. It's the same term that's used on the day of Pentecost when Peter spoke in, in his, his language and everyone heard it in their language. That same gift is given to Cornelius. And by the way, who better to give it to than a Roman centurion? The Roman centurions would be stationed throughout all the world. They would need to speak the languages of all, everyone. And what do you suppose Cornelius is going to be sharing? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he receives uh, that gift. Now friends, the main story here is not that. The main story is that at this point in history, now the Gentiles, that's me and you by the way, the Gentiles receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jews and Gentiles are becoming one body. And the, the gift of tongues was given as a sign to confirm what God was doing. And, and the important thing is not that giftedness. Amen? Say amen for me. Amen. The important thing is not that giftedness. That is simply the outward evidence of the internal work that God is doing in a person's heart. We all have gifts that we are to use for God. Amen? amen? Mine is the ability to get up here and preach and encourage and teach the Word of God and hopefully do it in somewhere between 40 and 42 minutes. The pot roast after all may burn. It, it, the rain may come back. See, but 
The amazing thing was that God was giving the Holy Spirit to live within the hearts of men. That is when this began. See, before that, the Holy Spirit didn't take up residence in the hearts of men. It did not happen. And what all this means is that when you believe in Jesus, God gives you a witness. You know, don't you like having a good witness on you? If you look on the screen, we'll see 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Do we have that back there? If not, then we'll... There we go. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is what? Greater. Greater. For this is the witness of God which He has testified of His Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in Himself... When you believe in the Son of God, you have the witness living in you. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his Son. What did God say from heaven? This is my Son. Isn't that a great verse though? That the Holy Spirit is given as a witness. Well, that's wonderful. But look at this next verse that we have here from Romans chapter 8 verse 16. It says... The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Oh, see, that, that's good news. I, 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 thought, I thought I'd get a testimony of that. I'm so glad I brought my own. Put that, put, that, put that verse back up again, please, if you could. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So now you have three witnesses, friends. The saints, the scriptures, and now comes the Holy Spirit. So what does that really mean, guys? What is that really all about? You, Miss Doreen, living in you, have the praise witness of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit that, it, that, that was the power in the creation. The Holy Spirit that is the enabling body in heaven for all the angels to rejoice and give praise to God. That Holy Spirit... Miss Doreen, and I, I'm calling her out because, you know, you've got, got to be somebody, and she loves me. Right now, people are watching on the video. Who is Miss Doreen? Where is she at? On the, on the video, she's right there. <laughs> that Holy Spirit bears witness. And the Holy Spirit of God inside of you says, listen, Jesus Christ is Lord. Praise Him in the sanctuary. Praise Him. Don't look around to see if anybody else is praising God. Praise Him. Don't look around to see if you look undignified praising your God. Praise Him. Amen. It said David prays so much he praised himself right out of his clothes. I don't want you doing that. <laughs> we are Baptists after all. You can, you, can move your, you can move your feet or you can move your hips. You can't move both. But praise Jesus in here. Listen. Now how do I know I'm certain of Jesus Christ? Listen to the progression and the witnessing that took place. First, because a saint witnessed to me. Just like Peter witnessed to Cornelius. My pastor, a little, a, a little Baptist church, Almeida Baptist Church in Louisiana, Brother Gene. See, that back, back, back in, in the Deep South, you called the pastor brother. Brother Gene witnessed. And Brother Gene says, he's alive, he's real, I know it. And in that, in that little church, I came forward to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, friends... I know because I've got the witness in myself. The Holy Spirit lives in my heart. And, and, and I understand that I have the witness of the testimony of God. Friends, I read my Bible unceasingly. And it bears witness to the truth of, God's, to the, truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit lives within me. And I give Him praise. I give Him praise for making me uh, uh, unseemly at times about Jesus. You know, you can get me to do a lot of things, but one thing you can't do is get me to shut up about Jesus. Amen. You know, uh, Coral Springs calls all the time. They want myself to go and pray on their day of prayer. But they say, we realize you're a Christian. We can't have you ending it with, in Jesus' name, amen. I said, well, then I'll, I'll pray that you guys get there sooner or later. Because I'm not coming until I can say that. Because, let me, I said, let me put it this way. I will, I, I will come if you let me. But I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And it sounds like crickets over the phone all of a sudden. Listen, friends. We are saved by faith, but faith is rooted in some evidence. Amen? I have the faith that God gave me. Turn in your Bibles real quick to Ephesians 2. We're about to wrap this up. Ephesians chapter 2. 
You guys know this passage very, very well. I've, I've, I've spoken about it many, many times. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. If you have a paper Bible and you're there, say amen. amen. There we go. All right, if you, if you have a paper Bible and you're there and you're not a pastor, say amen. amen. <laughs> it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of who? Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know what, friends? I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ lives in my heart. God's Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. My question is, do you have that same evidence living in your heart? So whether you're sitting here in the sanctuary today or you're watching on the internet or you're listening to, to uh, the broadcast over the radio somewhere, wherever you're at today, l l let me, let me just, just ask you this question. If I Listen to what I'm going to say and let me ask you something. If I were to tell you 100% assured Jesus Christ is returning for His, his children at 1 p.m. today, does that give you a leap of joy in your heart or a spark of fear? Because if it's a spark of fear, then you've got an issue. And you need to receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, let me ask you this as, as I'm wrapping this up. Uh, we, last page here, guys. You've been so patient in uh, the rain. And I know we got started a few minutes early and, and I, tried not to, I tried not to blather on too long here today. But... How does God know something? Uh, does God know something because He feels it emotionally? No. Does God know something because somebody tells Him? No. Of course not. God's not waiting on me or you or anybody else to tell Him anything. He knows the heart of man. Well, does God know something because He figures it out? He can calculate things. He doesn't have to figure anything out. He just automatically knows. He is omniscient. He knows because he knows because he knows. Amen. Amen. That is how God knows. So how do I know that I know God? Because I learned it? No. Because somebody else tells me? No. I know that I know that I know because the Spirit bears witness in my heart. Hallelujah. Looking back at Romans chapter 8, verse 16, I'm going to read this one more time. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, that's my spirit, that we, that means I, am a child of God. Amen. Don't you ever forget who you are. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen nice and loud in here. Amen. Listen, guys. Let's sum this up. There's the witness of the saints. There's the witness of the scripture. And there's the witness of the Holy Spirit. That is a threefold cord that can never, ever, ever be broken. The saints bear witness. The scripture bears witness. The Holy Spirit bears witness that you are a child of God and you are eternally saved. And you know that you know that you know that you know. And all of God's people said, Amen. Give Him praise in His house. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Grace and peace from God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for being so patient today. You know what? Thank you for joining us today. For more information, visit our website at www.lhcfl.com. Visit us on Facebook or get the Church Link app from the App Store. Again, thank you, and we hope to see you in service soon. You are God. You are God.